Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Cold Hard Truth NFL podcast. I'm your host, Anish Gupta. And I'm your host, Shrikar Rajendran. And we're back with kind of another like off season week. Uh, I really just can't wait for the season to start. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's not really dead, but we try and keep it alive. It, so no, it's it's dead. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start off with at least there's some some news. There's always some NFL news, and I guess the first one will be like the two free agent signings. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles took James Bradbury from the Giants, not like in a trade or anything, but, you know, he got released and then he was signed. I think it was a one year, $10 million deal. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, Bradbury is heading to Philadelphia. And then in a recent news, my Cleveland Browns re-signed Jadavion Clowney for a one year, $11 million deal. And he turned down apparently multi-year deals with other teams. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll let Trecar maybe start off on the Eagles trade and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I, I guess what I took away is nobody has had a better month than the Eagles have. Because if we look back, Howie Roseman, he's fortified pretty much, you know, a roster that was already promising with James Bradbury, Jordan Davis, Nicobe Dean, A.J. Brown. Look, the Eagles are still going to have questions regarding Jalen Hurts. You know, what's his long-term upside? But if you look at the supporting cast, I mean, would you would you say it's an elite supporting cast for Jalen Hurts? I'd I think it's bordering on that on that label. You got two really good corners in Darius Slay and James Bradbury, and they're going to go along well with a really good front seven as well. You got Jordan Davis, Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox, and offensively, Hurts is throwing to Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown and Dallas Goddard, and he's also behind one of the best O-lines in football. So if you're looking for that dark horse team in the NFC, I mean, Philadelphia really fits that bill well, so I think it's a great move to go and get James Bradbury. And again, Howie Roseman is basically fortifying this roster, giving Jalen Hurts a chance here. I mean, yeah, I, I can't really say enough about what Howie Roseman has done. Uh, I think, yeah, the Bradbury signing was great because it gives another corner alongside Darius Slay. And I just think it was it was really like a low risk, high reward deal, because if he isn't good, I know he's kind of getting up there in age. You can just let him walk, right? It's a one year deal. And yeah, Philly has been garnering a little bit of this hype coming into the year and it's well-deserved, uh, but there is now some expectations, right? Philly had no expectations last year. I mean, a lot of people had him like five and 12, you know, six and 11, kind of at the bottom feeder of the NFC and they shocked the world and they make the playoffs. I think that was probably the most unanticipated playoff team we saw last year. It was the Philadelphia uh, Eagles. The Bengals? Oh, right. Sorry, I meant NFC. In the NFC. Sorry. Yeah. In the NFC. I, yep. I meant to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were probably the most unanticipated. I think no one saw the Eagles making the playoffs in the NFC. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did. And uh, they didn't really do anything there. But at least it gave them some experience, especially going up against the GOAT. So... I think for the Eagles, especially with this Bradbury signing, it's just can you put the pieces together and do you show that you have, you know, promise and you're going in this upward direction because you were just at the mountaintop literally like four years ago and then you kind of went down and now you're coming back up. So is this rebuild complete? Like were you even in a rebuild to begin with? I think a lot of questions will be answered just because the Eagles also have draft capital uh draft capital later on uh, next year. I think they have two first round picks. So they've, they're they in a really good spot right now. Uh, but this does put a little bit of pressure on Jalen Hurts, which is weird because it's his, only his second year as a starter. But in the NFL, especially nowadays, things go quick. I mean, you're replaced really easily, uh, whether you're a quarterback, any position really. So uh, let's see if the Eagles can put it together. But I like the signing. I think James Bradbury has was a great corner in um, – New York. And then for Carolina, he was always kind of under the radar. Uh, a lot of people tried to, you know, compare him to Josh Norman when he really wasn't like him. I think he was a lot better uh, man to man. So I think, yeah, moving on from uh, Eagles with Bradbury, we're going to go to the Browns signing Jadavion Clowney. Uh, as a Browns fan, I mean, I wanted some interior defensive line help in the draft, and we did that with Perrion Winfrey. And now we get our, you know, other edge rusher back in Jadavion Clowney. We didn't really have Clowney and Garrett together much uh, last year. Uh, so I guess it's good to have them back. And all, not only that, it's good because both of them kind of thrive off each other. And Miles Garrett had an insane start to the year. And then he kind of drifted off with the groin pull. And we didn't really see Clowney take those necessary strides. He, he missed a couple games here and there. 
uh, last year. So hopefully those two can be healthy together. But I like the deal. Again, same thing, low risk, high reward. Uh, the Browns, you know, for the last, I think, three years, they've had a really good roster and they're just keeping it together. So I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I think Jadavion Clowney has been good for us and hopefully he can build on his last year and make it even better. Yeah, when we look back at Jadevian Clowney's career, it's been it's been kind of weird. Um, obviously, the number one pick back in 2014, he played five solid seasons with the Texans, then he was traded to the Seahawks, where he had three sacks in 11 games there, and then he went to the Titans, where you know he disappointed. Um, zero sacks zero in eight sacks. games. And then in Cleveland, Clowney went for nine sacks, which was... I'm pretty sure just, you know, a half sack off his career high. So look, paired with Miles Garrett, you know, Clowney is in a good spot. He's never going to see a double team. Um, and you look at the QBs in that division, especially Mitchell Trubisky and Joe Burrow. I feel like Clowney can wreak havoc there against immobile or, you know, somewhat immobile quarterbacks. And also Clowney knows this system. He thrived in it a year ago. So I like the move from a football perspective, but from a business side, I don't know. Clowney has to be somewhat disappointed because... If we look at the edge rusher market, money just flew around and Clowney ended up on another one year deal. And especially with all these reports saying there was a multi year offer on the table, extra security. Look, he's hit the market so many times in the last few years and he's never been able to find that security. And he's about to turn 30. So Clowney is probably looking at his last chance to earn a contract like that where he can have afforded, you know, more security. So. From a business side, I, I'm not. I'm a little questionable, but from a football perspective, I think it was a good decision by Clowney. I mean, well, f like I think executives can just look at it and say, "Well, what have you done for the last two years before coming to Cleveland?" Right? Like he hasn't been a consistently good player. He is for the number one overall pick. Obviously, he's never going to live up to that expectation. And there were times in Houston for the first couple of years where people were considering him a bust until he finally made the Pro Bowl. I think it was the year J.J. Watt got hurt. Yeah. Uh, so Jadavion Clowney really hasn't proven himself in the league to garner that type of deal. And that's not me saying well, he's but a bad player. On the table. There were a couple multi-year deals, but we don't know the annual offer. It could have just been more guaranteed money like over those two years. I think that's probably what he turned down. And I think, yeah, maybe he is banking on himself to, you know, have a really good year in 2022 and then still get one more deal. But I think even for the edge rusher market, it was never for a guy like him. I think the edge rusher market, it, it's really, there's levels. There's always levels in the NFL. And I, I think people realize across the NFL landscape that he's just not on the same level as other guys who would garner the same type of money. And age is definitely in a factor. And as you mentioned, he's hitting 30 soon, which is crazy to think about because he was just drafted in 2014, which doesn't seem long for a lot of us. Yeah. But I think this is his ninth season now, which is crazy to think about. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's good football wise. Yeah, I, I think we both agree it's a good signing. Hopefully... You know, the Browns defensive line is better with uh, Perry on Winfrey. I'm excited to see it. I just want Miles Garrett to finish off his seasons. I think that's been a problem for the last three years. He's been the defensive year, player of the year favorite for the first 12 weeks, literally all three seasons. And it's been one thing or the other, whether it was the suspension, COVID, or now a groin pull. He's just got to finish off the season strong. And that's really what I'm hoping for from Miles. Uh, hopefully the help of Perry on Winfrey and uh, Clowney is going to br bring him there. Right, and I've liked Winfrey for majority of the draft process. I've made both the knees check, and you know they know that. But uh, yeah, I, I like what Andrew Barry's doing with the D line and the defense in general. I think I think it's going to be pretty good here. So I actually I actually looked at at it just now. He turned down fourteen mil to fifteen million dollar offers multi year to stay in Cleveland on one year eleven mil. So well, well, looks like someone's found a home there. That's good. Hey. Yeah. Whoever's not a Browns fan out there watching this, us Browns fans say one thing: in Barry we trust. So, uh, <laughs> hey, that's that's just what that's just how we go around things. I believe me. Every time in the draft, I've had like a quick, you know, what, WTF moment to Andrew Barry, and he always comes through in the end. So I, I love that guy. He is literally keeping us. He's been the reason for our turnaround, one of the biggest ones. So speaking of the Browns and maybe a mistake on Barry's behalf, and one of the only mistakes I think he's ever done is obviously not tell Baker Mayfield about uh, the whole Deshaun Watson thing. And look, the whole Baker Mayfield saga has been one of the biggest talks of the offseason, which I never would have thought of uh, coming in. Uh, but we're going to take a turn kind of on, we are a podcast, and there are other podcasts out there. And uh, I never thought this in a million years, but Joe Burrow decided to hop on the Full Send podcast, uh, obviously a podcast by Nelk, 
uh, who's done crazy collabs. I mean, I think their biggest one to date was Donald Trump, which got taken down right away. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't speak anything on that, but like in the podcast, I watched the entire episode. Uh, these guys, uh, it's really, uh, it, it irks me because a lot of the questions they asked were things that Burrow had to clarify for them. For example, they didn't know he swept the Ravens last year. I'm like, what? They didn't know he was drafted in the COVID year. Like, like these are basic things that you should know. Uh, I like. I mean, I don't know. That I feel like that's just my personality. I, I'm I'm a football geek. I know pretty much everything, so I would I would know everything going into it. But yeah, that kind of irked me. But one thing they did ask Joe Burrow was about Baker Mayfield, and uh, he basically said that you know he's a good player and he will land on his feet. That's that's literally what he kind of said. And obviously, from his perspective, he's never beaten Baker Mayfield. And Baker Mayfield, some of his best career games have been against Cincinnati, if not like his top three. So uh, to say that, like, you know, you're getting a good perspective here from a quarterback who is experienced and knows what it takes to be an NFL quarterback. Uh, but I'll kind of start it off here. I, I, I've been a Baker defender. And when Burrow says something like that, you got to you got to take it and pause for a minute. Right. Why is why are a lot of football players kind of, you know, at least saying, at least especially quarterbacks that I've seen, they haven't shown any, you know, hate towards Baker Mayfield on in terms of his play. And everybody who's been kind of taunting and hating are just guys who, you know, either are big supporters of Odell Beckham or just media analysts that obviously want to stir some attention. So I don't really know what's the whole point there. I, I think for Baker Mayfield, it's just he's got to find a team. Someone, someone's got to take a chance. And I, I'm really hoping out there that a team does because I still have faith in this guy. I think he's still a good quarterback given the right chance. And if the Browns recently, there was a report saying they were willing to take up a decent chunk of his salary. You've got to take that chance. I mean, you're getting a guy at potentially maybe 10 mil of his caliber who was once considered a top 10 quarterback literally a year and a half ago. Come on. I mean, like that, that's, if I'm, I think NFL teams should be lining up, especially a team like Seattle, who's been disappointed with Drew Locke and Geno Smith in camp. Come on. Like that it's right there. So if you've got other guys co-signing on Baker's ability, I think it's a it's a no-brainer to just take a chance. Yeah, he he's basically complimenting Mayfield Burrow is, but he's also he's just being honest here. I mean, you look at Mayfield's stock, it's definitely down because of what he did in 2021, played poorly through that shoulder injury. But I agree with you. I feel like the hate is unwarranted. I've been critical of Baker Mayfield. I've never, I've never, you know, went out of my way to hate on him. Um, but we look back as a rookie throwing for 27 touchdowns despite having two head coaches. That's very impressive. 2020, you know, Baker was the guy that led the Browns to their first playoff victory since I'm sure you remember the year, but it was a long time. Yeah, um, 1994. I mean. His maturity has been called into question, and I feel like that's fair. But you look at the upside, it's you know it, it's definitely top 10 upside in a league with a lot of teams desperate for a guy like that. So even though it may be uncomfortable for the Browns, for whoever's trading for him, the Browns should just wait, deal Mayfield once he, get decent, once he gets some decent value out of it. So as I said before, they're going to wait until training camp. Something will pop up, and Mayfield will be traded then, but... I feel like people, people, you know, that are that are hating on Mayfield per se. I, I just don't get it. I, I I don't get it either. I think fans have forgotten, and I mean, obviously, I know the media, and especially like now TikTok has come up and stuff like that. The NFL is kind of getting sw swooped by younger fans. People don't realize how ridiculed the Browns were early on in the 2010s, the 2000s. I mean, this was a franchise that was literally putting paper bags over their heads you don't understand they were the complete laughing stock of the nfl way worse than what the lions are getting right now like this team has been ridiculed they weren't even considered a a competent franchise for such a long time and this dude within literally a year makes them the talk of the town of a potential super bowl berth like i mean i, I don't think you understand sure there was a lot of things that went involved. As I mentioned, Andrew Barry, Kevin Stefanski, the whole personnel change. But come on. I mean, you it, you got to give a quarterback credit. And I don't know. Like, if Mahomes was drafted the same situation, do you really think he was the, would be the same guy? I can't answer that. Like, as much as and as great of a talent as he is. Same thing with Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, all these, you know, big-time guys, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow. Can you really sit up and say that? 
Quarterbacks are very determined by their situations. I think we've seen that time and time again. And Baker made pretty well off of his, given his situation. Four head coaches in the first three years. Hell, his 27 touchdowns were off of 13 starts because his own head coach didn't believe in him. He said he won the backup role on, on hard knocks on national TV. So, look, I'm not saying Baker is going to be a bona fide star. I'm not saying he is one right now. But to sit up here and say he's not a, stat, a starting caliber quarterback or to say that there's no market for him or he's not that guy, I come on. I mean, that that's just, that's just pure hating at this point. And I really hope a team like Seattle does take a chance because obviously I think I've been saying it for a while. I think it's a great fit. But there's also a lot of ways he can find a new home. I mean, if a quarterback gets hurt in camp, if a quarterback gets hurt during the season, I mean, I think the Browns just have to wait for the right moment, and that's what they're doing. They can eat up the money. They literally have the cap space to do it. And once it's gone, it's gone. Like, the next year, they won't have to worry about it. So I think they're chilling. Um, and I think Baker Mayfield's also chilling at home. He's not going to attend any of the volunteer uh, voluntary OTAs. But, I mean, yeah, I think this is just, you know, this was a topic just to remind everybody what he did for at least my franchise and what he could do for yours. And I think Joe Burrow at least is somewhat on that train. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of quarterbacks, it, it is a quarterback driven league. We're going to continue with another quarterback segment here. Uh, we went back and forth on this one. So in terms of, you know, what quarterbacks are under pressure and what quarterbacks, you know, have a lot to prove, we're going to kind of combine those two because we essentially they do mean a little of the same thing. So mm -hmm. we, came up with three guys that we think are either kind of under pressure or have a lot to prove in 2022. Uh, and I'll let Trigar give his first one. So I would say the QB under the most pressured this year is Deshaun Watson. It's a name that I never really see, you know, when people bring up this discussion. Uh, I know I'll give a shout out to Go House. They did a video on this. And as I was watching that video, I was thinking the whole time, where is Deshaun Watson? They were naming the guys that you, you know, expect to have named but I just don't think anyone will be under the microscope more than him because not only from an off-field perspective but from a football perspective too this Browns team we just talked about it they're moving off a guy they drafted with the first pick in 2018 for Watson who is currently awaiting league action they also gave up a ton of draft compensation they gave him the most guaranteed money in NFL history so all I'm saying is the pressure is on for Watson to deliver not only like getting to the playoffs, but deep playoff runs. And think about it, this city is starved for even one deep playoff run. So that's why, in my opinion, Deshaun Watson is under the most pressure this year to deliver because if he comes out the gate stumbling after a year off and with all the off-field concerns, obviously this was a very controversial move, it would just be a terrible look for the organization. And I don't know if Anish is going to differ on that. I, I, maybe he will, but I really feel like Deshaun Watson is under the microscope for basically the entire season. I mean, with the luck of the Browns, it would be something to happen. It would He would somehow stumble after being an amazing quarterback at Clemson and Houston, and then once he comes here, he struggles. But, I mean, I'm obviously I think I'm going to not really disagree, but I, I, I do see your points, right? He's obviously the draft compensation, the money, and I think people are just expecting if he plays the full year, the Browns will go on this deep playoff run because he's shown it in Houston, he's shown it in Clemson, and he's a multifaceted and very talented quarterback uh but you're right you can never guarantee things in the nfl there's no such thing as a guarantee in this right. league and it's an any given sunday mentality and you're right i mean hell i picked them in the afc championship in that little se uh, schedule thing that i did but look let's be real i mean even with the year, okay i think the year off point I, I just want to eradicate because we've seen so many quarterbacks come back after a year and just be the same joe burrow had to rehab and or sorry he had, yeah he had to rehab and then play uh after a year as of long as he's in shape like i don't think yeah i don't think you understand he is in shape he's been working out for the last year and if you watch practice film which the browns have given us it looks pretty fine to me but my only thing with deshaun watson is yeah the, the entire expectation and then it's gonna fall on oh my god you know they took a big chance with the off the field stuff and now look at the product because the Browns will be under heavy, you know, criticism for the next three years because that's what the compensation they gave up for. And in a loaded AFC, you got to make your mark somehow, right? And Deshaun yeah. Watson is the type, on paper, he is the guy to do that. So I agree with you. There is some pressure. I don't think there's much for Deshaun to prove. I think people already put him in that top five to seven convo. It's just now you've got to maybe shine and 
really deliver you're because, about the team. Right. If you're a top five quarterback, you've got to make it somewhere. You like I don't care. Look, I don't care about the empty stats. In the NFL, I want to win. Like that's why it really gets, you know, on my nerves when people are like, Oh, but this guy's just, you know, so good. If only he had a team. Well, how long do you want to say that? Right? So I mean Quarterbacks are great, but you got to show me results, win some games, win a ring. I mean, like, that's what you need to establish yourself in this league, or at least make a mark. Football immortality is defined by Super Bowls. That's just how it is for quarterbacks, and you've got to make your mark. And I, I guess Deshaun Watson won't be defined by that yet. He's only 26, but the wins and the questions will keep coming, and especially now. He's entering the prime, so to say, of his career. you got to show it to us, and hopefully he delivers because, hey, I mean, you know, as a diehard Browns fan, I would love for that to happen. Uh, but we'll move on to the next quarterback. Uh, for me, I, I think this is a pretty obvious one, so I'll just start it off. Tua Tagovailoa. This one is more of under pressure, right? It's his third year. Uh, third year is usually the big one for quarterbacks. And is he going to garner that fifth-year option? Are the Dolphins going to move off him in 2023? Because uh, I believe they have two first-round picks next year, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. So, yeah, it, they could be easily get another one of those quarterbacks in the 23 class. Uh, and look, in terms of an offensive personnel perspective, Mike McDaniel is the perfect fit. Raheem Mostert is a great fit. Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, spread offense. It's all there. I mean, he does. he's not going to be asked to throw the ball down the field for all of you casuals who don't understand the game. He won't be asked to throw it down the field 40, 50 yards. It's quick quick passes, yards after the catch. And if you need a go-getter, you've got Mike Gesicki, who's 6'7". You can throw it up the seam. So the this whole notion that he can't thrive in this offense is completely stupid. Now it's up to Tua to do it, right? right. So that's where the pressure kind of comes in. And for the Dolphins, you've been one game back for the last two years, right? One game out of the playoffs. And it, it really sucks because you've had winning seasons two years in a row, and you just still can't make it. It's just the competition that there is. That's how the NFL works. Uh, we've seen the Pats go 11-5 and five and miss the playoffs. Jets go 10-6 and six and miss the playoffs. Now it's your time. Just get over the hump, and Tua's got to do it. If he doesn't make the playoffs, right, it's it's going to depend a lot on circumstance. But if you don't have a winning season with this with this group, it might be time to move off. Yeah, it's it's done at that point. And I was I was going to say Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Mike Kosicki. I mean, life is just going to be hell for defenses that have to face that, and it's all up to Tua to you know make the most of it. And you Teron know, Armstead, they invested in the O line yep, as well. He's going to be better protected, and you got Teron Armstead. As you said, Armstead's going to be protecting his front side, so. All the things about, you know, is he going to throw deep and all that? I think Mike McDaniel's really good. And it's kind of like something with the Shanahan offense in general. It's always about, I think he's going to be good at getting the most out of his players based on their strengths. So I think with Waddle and Hill, I think they'll be used in the correct way. Obviously, seeing what he did with Debo, I, th I think they're going to be fine, especially Waddle. I'm excited to see what he can do with Mike McDaniel. Um, but I, it's... Tua has to prove that he is the no doubt future quarterback in Miami. If there's, you know, and even any doubt still lingering, it's not so much of a sure thing. Then you know, obviously they have two firsts next year, so they can easily just replace him. It, but even if he, if he does show up, I don't know what that contract is going to look like. That's something I've been thinking. They about won't. They they have leverage. They have leverage even if he shows up, because then they're just going to say you got to show it again. So. Right. I think in terms of contract wise, there's going to be there's a, they, the Dolphins have all the leverage in the world because if Tua doesn't want to resign, and based on the look of how their supporting cast is on paper, they can say, hey, we can just put in another quarterback and they'll do the same thing. Like yeah. I think that's what the Dolphins are kind of preparing themselves for. So I right. think the Dolphins have all the leverage with the contract. Um, but yeah, let's kind of move on to the next quarterback. I'll, I'll start this time. Yeah, sure. uh, it's a guy that we, we used to talk uh, so much about, and uh, I want to bring his name back into the convo. Daniel Jones. Uh, he's As much as I do love him and defend him, he is under some pressure. Uh, a lot of pressure this year. Uh, they didn't pick up his fifth year. So... Look, you, you, got, you got to show us something, man. As as much as I still think he's talented, and I really do think he is, I don't think he's gotten a fair chance. And he limited the turnovers, especially down the stretch last year before his neck injury, uh, which they kind of just rested him, honestly. Look, you've got a decent supporting cast. The offensive line, at least they invested in it. I don't know if it's going to come together. <laughs> like, does it ever? I, I don't know. But Brian Dable is a good coach, and I think they've really made some good moves the Giants have. Uh, let's let's see you at least show some promise, right? I, th I think that's all you'd want to see from him 
or just a, a good statistical year is probably enough to maybe garner some type of extension, right? I don't know if his time in New York can come to an end, but what I do know is the Giants did do a good job this offseason, and he's got he's got some personnel that he can work with. Yeah, it's the schedule is you know relatively easy. Uh, Brian Dable, QB friendly head coach, Joe Shane and Dable have both said they believe in Daniel Jones. Like they're putting full faith in this guy. Uh, the receiving core, they at least start camp with, you know, they could be impact guys. And obviously Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal as your tackles. The offensive line looks somewhat better. So, I, I mean, Daniel Jones, it's all on him right now. And, and hopefully Dable can work wonders with him. I, I don't know what he's going to do because if you look at the Josh Allen process, it, it, that development took a while. So if, if you have, you know, one year to really prove it, he's got the pieces if I had to make a guess, I'm going to say the Giants move on off of him after this year. He could be a solid backup, or maybe if a team is in desperate need of a starter, they'll go for a Daniel Jones. But He's got all the tools. He's big, he's strong, he's quick, he's mobile. I mean, it's like, like this is... I you've got to win. He's just got to, he's got to prove it, or he's got to put it all together. That's, that's all it's been for Daniel. And he's, he's progressed every year. As much as people have like been shaky about it, he has gotten better each year at something. So yeah, this has got to be the year where he puts it together and at least shows something, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I've been saying, if you could just have Saquon Barkley for the entire year, it would, it would help, but Saquon's kind of a shell of himself as well. So I don't know. It's 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 a tough one, but he definitely is under some pressure. I mean, you you've got to at least show something, and this is one of the lightest schedules in the league. The NFC East as a whole has the lowest, um, uh, how do you say that, or easiest schedule by win percentage. So, yeah, let's let's see you do it, DJ. All right, hit yeah. us with your next one. All right, my next guy is Kyler Murray, and if we're talking about the Arizona Cardinals, there's just really weird vibes with this, you know, version of the squad. And it's mainly because of all the drama with Kyler Murray. Obviously, Hopkins gets that six-game suspension. Christian Kirk is gone. And look, and this has everything to do with Kyler Murray's contract negotiations right now because he wants a big contract, but he hasn't done enough to the point where he can match other, you know, star QB's resumes in terms of what they're getting. So this is the year. He needs to have a either a career year or a deep playoff run in order to really warrant that contract from Arizona because the Cardinals, Steve Kime has all the leverage here. He can just hold on and say, you got to prove it to us before we give you, you know, $40 million a year. So I think he is under a lot of pressure, especially with no Hopkins for the first six games. They're real. It's really a test here. They're trying to see what he can do when, you know, the odds are kind of stacked against him here in a tough division. So I think Kyler Murray's the second guy on my list. I would have said Tua, but we definitely wanted different quarterbacks here. So Kyler's the guy. I'm going to disagree with the leverage part. I think Kyler has all the leverage because if Steve Kime doesn't pay him, where, where are you going to go? Who are you going to get? You're not going to get a quarterback of Kyler's caliber, and you this team is too good to do bad to you get a good quarterback. No, you wouldn't, but even if you trade Kyler, who's going to want him? Because he's just going to demand a big contract, right? Like, what right. team Someone right now? willing to give that up. But what, what team? Like, because Kyler will probably garner more than what Deshaun Watson got. So are you, is a team really willing to give that up? I don't think so. Especially for a guy who's shown he can be pretty self-centered and, again, has been injury prone. The last two years, the seasons have been derailed by his injuries. The shoulder in 2020 and then the, uh, I think it was the hamstring in 2021. So, right, right. like, I, if anything, I think Kyler's got all the leverage here because the Cardinals know they kind of have to stick with him. He is a top 10 quarterback, and it's it's just like you're, you can't but, really move off him right now. But I'm also saying for this year they have the leverage. Next year is a whole different story. It depends on, you know. Kyler's going to play. Like, there's no way. Like, if Kyler doesn't right, play. He can't, he can't hold out. Yeah, the exactly. players don't have the leverage. No, no. But Kyler, even if Kyler plays and even if he doesn't do well, which I don't think is, I mean, if yeah, let's say he doesn't do well, right? Then fine. The Cardinals say, okay, we're just going to move off you. Then, yeah, fine. He'll maybe lose lose out on some of that. But, like, the Cardinals will have to move him if if he doesn't do well. My only thing with Kyler, like in terms of like pressure or most to prove, I don't think he has really much to prove yet. I think, yeah, there is some pressure because look, I don't know why people are so shocked when I have the Cardinals regressing this year. I mean, they've lost Chandler Jones. D-Hop is not going to be there for the first six weeks. I mean, other teams in the NFC have gotten better, right? Like why, why are we so shocked 
if anything, I would be shocked if they improved, and I'm hoping they do because they've been improving every year, but it's it's just going to be a lot of odds are stacked against them. And, yeah, this Kyler situation is just really, really murky. Mm -hmm. So that that's where I kind of am skeptical on the cards. I still think they right some of the wrongs and go 9-8. and eight. That was what I had in my schedule thing, but uh, only time will tell. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to the final quarterback, and the one I'm going to have is probably the most shocking one on this list. Uh, it's Justin Herbert, and that's so ironic because it's like, what? This dude is arguably a top five quarterback. Well, what is there I could possibly say to hate on him? It's not even hate. It's just like, you've got to make the playoffs, dude. Like, I mean, if you don't, if Justin Herbert doesn't make the playoffs next year, that's a really big concern. I mean, the Chargers have everything. They have the roster. They have the coaching staff. They have like, I mean, what are we missing here? Why? Why is a guy like Justin Herbert? Why can't he make it, right? He went 7-9 and nine in his first year. He won his final four games. He's one game shy, literally, or like an overtime shy of making it the year prior. And he lost to the Texans. If he didn't have that Texans loss, he would have been in. And I know there was no Mike Williams or Joey Bosa, but you got to win that game, right? You have to win that game. So, yeah, Justin Herbert, you've got to make the playoffs. Like, this is a team that has to be there. I don't care if they're division winners, a wild card team. You have to be there in next year's postseason. Or if you don't, that's a really you. You're going to be one of the biggest disappointments of 2022. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, you have to make it. Like, no, the, I, I agree. I agree. I, I think he's definitely in that conversation. Statistically speaking, he can do it. One of the most talented quarterbacks in the league. But at some point, you got to win. You right, just that, have to yeah, win the big games. That's my point. Like that Texans loss last year, that's inexcusable. And I I definitely put some blame on Herbert for that. And it's not only on Staley or the defense. It's on Herbert too. I you that's a game you need to win down the stretch. And if we look at their slate this year, before Thanksgiving, it's not really too hard because you got Jacksonville, Atlanta, Houston, and Seattle in that early portion. Obviously, you're in the toughest division in football. But you got to prove that you can hang in those games. And especially, and this is a good, it's a good test for him because you're going against the likes of Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Derek Carr. So with all they've done, they drafted Zion Johnson. They re-signed Mike Williams. You know, Herbert's got it around him. Tom Telesco has done a really good job of building this team. And now it's really on him to show that this team can make it to the playoffs. And not only that, can you make a run? Um, and a little spoiler alert, but and Anish had them in the AFC Championship. You want to go check I out? Had them in the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah, in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He had them beat. Yeah. Him. But uh, yeah, it's it's all on Herbert right now. So yeah. I definitely include him in the conversation. I agree. You got it. Look, if he doesn't do it and Burrow keeps making the playoffs, you can say all you want about his statistical tools or whatever. But I'm gonna take the guy that's winning me games. So right, look, that that's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, and my third quarterback here. Another name that might, you know, surprise some people, it's Russell Wilson. And it, we got to think about what the Broncos have invested in a guy that is turning 34, was injured last year. Is he still elite? I mean, I'll, I'll say, yes, he is. Come on. But there is a possibility for regression. Uh, and obviously, we look at it from a weapons perspective. You've got a lot of weapons do you have a real deal wide receiver one out of the guys they have i'd say sutton but i mean even is he like a real deal wide receiver one he's good him judy patrick hamler that's all good i don't know but with russell wilson i think based on what they invested in him and his age and he's playing in the toughest division in football i'd say there's a lot of pressure around russell wilson this is one of the biggest trades in league history too so I think the pressure is definitely on for Russell Wilson in Denver. I think Russ got a little bit lucky that the Deshaun Watson trade happened just because the capital for the D-Watt trade was a little bit more. But here's what I'll say about Russ. Uh, it's crazy because I've said it for the last few years, right? Like, he's disappointed in the playoffs pretty heavily. Like, really bad. Like, he hasn't gotten out of the divisional round since 2015. So, yeah, he's been a constant favorite, and he just doesn't show up. And this is one of the smartest, most talented quarterbacks we have in football, maybe ever. But for Russell Wilson, here's here's the thing where I'm saying the pressure-wise, there's not much. Because I don't think anyone's expecting the Broncos to make a deep playoff run. They're just expecting them to get back there. That's what it's been all about for the Broncos, which really sucks to say. Because they haven't had these big expectations. But they've missed it for the last six years since Peyton Manning. Just getting back to the playoffs, I think, is a good enough feat for the Broncos fans. Which shouldn't be the goal, but it I should. think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And... 
I've seen a lot of people criticize, you know, why do I have the Broncos 10 and 7 or in the playoffs? They I think they'll make it. It's just they I don't think they're going to go far. Um I I don't think we can doubt Russell Wilson in the regular season. I think he's come to a point where he knows how the game works. He's very smart. He's very talented and I I don't think we should question him in that regard. Uh the only Pressure, I guess, would be, you know, in terms of his legacy standpoint, what does he mean for the NFL? And I think it's already been defined. Like, I, I don't think an extra ring is going to vault him anywhere up. I, I really don't because, frankly, he's not going to – I don't think he's going to win MVP next year. And if he does, hey, th- that's honestly a dark horse. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even throw it out of the question. Um, but you're talking about his offensive personnel. I think it's great. I mean, he's got four good receivers. Sure, none of them are wide receiver one right now. Sutton's at least proved it before in 2019. And not only that, Judy's got some of the most upside out of any receiver in the league. So uh, I think he's fine there. And then Javante Williams also, some of the most upside out of any running back. Uh, I think Nathaniel Hackett is a good offensive mind. And they took that tight end from UCLA uh, in the third round, I'm pretty sure. So that was a that was a good pick. Um Defense has always been good, and sure, there's no Vic Fangio there anymore, but I think the defensive personnel is still good. The Broncos have all the tools to make it to the playoffs. I don't think anyone's expecting a big run out of them, which is why I don't think there's really pressure on him, but there is something to prove for Russell Wilson in the playoffs because, frankly, he hasn't done anything in it for the last, what, seven years. One thing you didn't mention was the O-line. Uh, outside of Garrett Bowles, I'm not sure how good Yeah, the O-line's a bit iffy, but when has Russell Wilson had a good O-line? So. Yeah, exactly. He, he's worked with worse. Yeah, so. they've tra- and they've they've yeah. At least they didn't trade away his best offensive lineman like like they did with Max Unger. Mm-hmm. For all the younger fans out there who didn't know, it was Max Unger for Jimmy Graham. I still remember that trade. That was that was crazy. Uh, let's just say it didn't it didn't really work out for. I mean, it worked out for the Saints, I guess. Yeah, it didn't work out for the Seahawks. Everyone thought it would be the other way around, but mm-hmm. hey, that just goes to show you know it doesn't really happen like that. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, so for our final topic, uh, we're going to go into something that's a little bit predictive and, you know, just not really hot takes, but it's basically which teams will not repeat as division champs. Now, every year, there's a team that goes from worst to first, like last year was the Bengals, right? And we, we see it happen all the time. Uh, we're not really going for that because I think it's pretty obvious probably the Ravens will be everyone's like pick for that. So we'll go with which teams will not repeat as division champs. And there's some dark horses out there. So if you're still watching, leave leave it in the comments. I'm really interested in seeing you know what you guys have because I'm sure a lot of people will say the Chiefs for one. You know, a lot of people will maybe say the Packers. Uh, but we came in with two different teams, obviously. So uh, I'll start. Uh, mine's going to be the Cowboys. I've had this hot take now for a while that I think they'll be third in the division. So I think the Commanders and the Eagles will usurp them, but we'll just focus on the Eagles for now. I think the Eagles will be the 2022 NFC East champs, and I think that's I think that's becoming a consensus across you know the NFL media world. Um, what's there not to like? We talked about the Eagles earlier, right? We've I mean you know obviously I'm not going to repeat everything, but they've got a lot of great pieces, and I think Harry Roseman has done one hell of a job. But I'm going to focus on Nick Sirianni in this topic. I, I think he is a hell of a coach. Uh, And just because he stumbles in an introductory press conference, that should not define his role as a head coach in this league. Uh, So he had the best rushing offense the second half of 2021. And uh, I only think it's going to get better. Obviously, they lost Brandon Brooks, which really sucks. But, uh, okay, I'm going to try and pronounce the the tackle. Jordan Matalata. Matalata. How do you say it? Matalata. Matalata. Okay. I I always forget. I forget where the, like, H, like, the ha sound is. Okay. Matalata. Yeah, I think he's coming into his own. Um, look, I'm just glad they got rid of Jason Peters when they did because you saw him for the Bears. He's just old and <laughs> he's out of it, man. It sucks to say, but yeah, he just didn't really keep in shape. Uh, unlike, you know, Big Wit. But uh, yeah, I think the Eagles offensive line is fine and dandy. Uh, also, I think obviously what they made in terms of defensive acquisitions, they've got a guy who can replace Fletcher Cox when they need to let him go, which is perfect because the number one thing you got to do in the NFL and what Bill Belichick has mastered is getting rid of players early rather than late because you can afford to get rid of a player early. You can kind of replace them when you get rid of them too late. That's really bad because they kind of take up a spot. You know, it's usually cost inefficient. So uh, I think that's what kind of Howie Roseman has been doing uh, these past couple of years, and I've I've really liked what they in the trajectory that they're going in. And I don't think the Cowboys go five. No, actually, not five and one, six and zero oh in the division. They're not doing that again. There's no way. Uh, and if they do, hey, you can criticize me all you want, but there, I just do not see it. Uh, and I think that's where it kind of starts. And I think the Eagles will do better than the Cowboys, it, not by a lot, probably like one or two games. But yeah, that's what I see. 
Yeah, we just talked about it before, but they're again, they're definitely that dark horse team out of the NFC. When you brought up Sirianni's introductory presser, it kind of it kind of made me, I forgot about it until I remember you and Jack I, criticized I him not so like much it. for it and yeah, I was like him, yeah, I was fun. like what are you guys talking about like schematically it's a good fit. I don't care about a stupid stumble. Uh, but yeah, I also forgot to mention the Cowboys lost a lot of pieces, right? I didn't. Even First talk impressions about it. are everything, huh? I mean, you got it. You got to show it. So uh, he did show it. Um, he's definitely he's definitely the right coach for the Eagles. Also, I love what Howie Roseman's been doing. This is definitely a really really good supporting cast. Again, it all depends on Jalen Hurts. If I had to make a guess, I'm still gonna say the Cowboys win the division but yeah, i think it's gonna come down to week 18. on what though like but here's my thing right the tension i trust that McCarthy... got to do it again i i, the, I okay but the tension with mccarthy is only growing and then like the expectation is gonna fall on him you know how cowboys fans are and not only that but they've think, lost so many pieces so I think, many i think that tension only boils over in the playoffs with another early exit and then that's where i think mike mccarthy's done I think they'll get it done in the regular season. Um, but yeah, okay, but here's right. my thing. Out of the NFC East, which teams got better in the offseason and which teams got worse? Like, not a lot of teams got worse in the offseason. The Cowboys were one of the few. It's, Eagles got better, Cowboys got worse. I, I'm not disagreeing with you there. Washington got better, the Giants got better. The play is very big. And right now, I trust Dak Prescott over Jalen Hurts. And that's really what's forced me to ride with the Cowboys again. Uh, but again, in the playoffs, much different story. It's it's a lot different when they reach the playoffs. So I think I think you're overrating Dak a little bit. Like, look at the second half of the year. I mean, no, I'm was, overrating was, Dak. I'm comparing he was him six to and Hurt. five against not okay. So against winning teams, he was I believe five and six. And the only win where he they didn't have a hundred rushing yards came from Cooper Rush. So he was zero and I think he was zero and six when his team didn't go over a hundred rushing yards. And yeah, six and zero against you know. Measly. Well, what would Jalen Hurts do if his team never went over a hundred rushing yards? Well, he's part of the rushing yards. He's part of the con- contribution. It's his dynamic ability that gives the Eagles that. Dak that- isn't going to be the entire rushing offense. That's just. So, but that's the point, Gale right? So Dak, 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 low key relies on it, right? Jalen Hurts is part of it. So if Dak Prescott, like this has always been the case. When Ezekiel Elliott was suspended his second year, they couldn't make the playoffs. Like it, it's just always been the case. And I'm not saying Dak is not a or not a you know top ten to fifteen guy. I, I think I have him outside my top ten though, uh, pretty confidently. It's just he's he's shown very suspect games especially the second half of the year where he would have teams come back in games and you've seen it right his 400 passing yard games you know he has a losing record in games where he's thrown over 400 it's yards garbage time that's the point yeah so what does that say about Dak Prescott right like is he really the type of dude is he really the bona fide guy like in the NFC East I like I don't know and I think people are overrating Dak a little bit I don't think he can overcome the losses that Dallas has had I wouldn't I wouldn't say he is the bona fide guy but only because I don't trust him in the playoffs like at all regular season's a whole different thing I feel like he can still do good in the regular season but in the playoffs against like had one bad playoff game so it's not even that it's just like it's just him it's just him as a quarterback in general especially in the second half of the season and he's just not a guy that's going to uplift the team he's only had one bad playoff game you can't knock him the Dallas, the first one against Aaron Rodgers, he was tremendous. The one against Russell Wilson, he outplayed him at home. Uh, the Rams game, it was just the Rams rushing attack that beat the Cowboys. And then the one against, um, uh, what is it, the Niners, I guess you can say was bad Niners by him. Not that's good. Pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That, no other good. game where he's... I rewatched the Rams one, but I, I feel like if we're just talking off regular season, because it's just who's going to win the division. I'm gonna I'm gonna side with Dak Prescott over a guy like Jalen Hurts. And then one more thing, like one more thing about Dak Prescott, right? He was three and five, right? And on the brink of people questioning his true like presence in the NFL until Amari Cooper got there. Amari Cooper is the reason Dak Prescott got that money. Every Cowboys fan knows it, and everyone will admit it. Think about it. He was three and five. They were doing terrible in 2018. Amari Cooper comes in, and what happens? The first game. The first game at home, it was 200 yards against the Eagles. So this whole notion that Dak Prescott is, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't know. We're going to have to see it without Amari Cooper. He's better that's than Jalen Hurts. He's better than Carson Wentz as of right now. That's just how it is. But that doesn't mean he's going to win the division. I think you're you, you're using just the quarterback. That. Like, this is where – this is the means a case. lot. But no, but not in this case. Not where the yeah, Eagles have a better coaching staff. They have a better defense. They have a better running game. They have better offensive personnel. And they have a – O-line, I guess, is tough. I think the Cowboys will probably have a better... 
Yeah, but I think I think the Eagles have it beat everywhere else, and I I trust. I think I think you're you're forgetting that Jalen Hurts can elevate as a quarterback, and I've seen a lot of people think, oh my God, he has such limitations as a passer. Well, it's his first year as a starter. Like you got to give him some benefit of the doubt. And then even with Carson Wentz and Washington, I mean that team was six and six right prior to before their team got ravaged by COVID, and they only had sixteen passing touchdowns in a pass driven league. So. They can only go up from here. Same thing with the Giants. I, I think you're overrating Dak Prescott a little bit. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, forgot. I, say, I think it comes down to week 18. Like, I don't, it's not going to be a situation where the Cowboys comfortably win the division. I think it comes down to week 18. I think the Cowboys are going to do enough to win the division. So I, 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 I don't even think it comes down to week 18. That's pretty cool. I, I really don't. I Because the Eagles don't play. I don't think the Eagles play. I think it's Commanders and Washington. Uh, week 18 and I picked I picked the commanders to win it because I believe that one's at home uh, So yeah, I actually picked I picked the commanders to win that one right so, But if they have similar records, it's still gonna mean something for you know play. Yeah, I, I think yeah And my thing I, I think Philly gets a two-game lead on them and they're safe. That's what I have um, But yeah, I think you're overrating just the fact that one guy is gonna right every wrong when he's be, got a losing be, record I mean, a lot. That's all I'll say and we're in May. So we're kind of going off what's on paper here, but and I mean, on paper, the I, Cowboys I, look pretty bad. I, I value QB a lot more than you probably do. So, What? Whoa, what? I'm the QB guy here. No, no. It really just comes down to Dak Prescott as him. He's not the guy that you should be overvaluing. He's not. Like, he's not a guy that – look at his past years. Look at Dak Prescott in the past years. What has he done? And he was one, one in four. Last year. He had no, but look at the teams. Look at the teams he was facing. Like in the in actual good competition, he was a 500 quarterback. Good competition, he was a 500 quarterback. And the game that um, they beat the Eagles in, both were resting starters. So it like the game was meaningless for both. And also, right? Look at look at Dak Prescott just throughout the years. Like I've said, right? In the games where he's borderline elite great performances he doesn't win them like he was one and four in 2020 despite having all the the passing records and he was on pace for like a six thousand yard year he was down 41 to 14 against the browns he was down 15 against seattle he before throwing a pick to lose the game like dak prescott is don't get me wrong above average talent he's a you know he's a good dude but you're i think out of all the quarterbacks to bank your money on not the guy Interesting. I mean, it's an interesting take from Anish. I, I'm, I'm still gonna. Well, it is the consensus though. A lot of, a lot more people have the Eagles over the Cowboys now, but uh, mine is actually not even the AFC North. It's the AFC South. I think the Colts are gonna win the division over the Titans. We've talked about it before. We are both. I'm not as much of a believer as Anish in, as Anish is in the Colts, but I think we're both kind of on that train that Matt Ryan will definitely make them better. Uh, but I also think it's Tennessee getting worse too. Obviously, the A.J. Brown trade, you know, Mike Vrabel's a hell of a coach. I'll say that first and foremost. They are going to definitely be a well-coached squad. But I don't think I believe in Ryan Tannehill without A.J. Brown. I know Anish loves Traylon Burks in this system, that he can do what A.J. Brown can do. I can't put my hopes in a rookie replicating what A.J. Brown was able to do for this offense and immediately becoming, well, he will get volume. I agree with you there, but... I think the Colts with Matt Ryan, I think they'll end up having the same record as last year, like a nine and eight, 10 and seven type of year. But I think Tennessee just regresses pretty heavily here into like back to where they were in those nine and seven years. I think they'll go like eight and nine, something like that. And the Colts will eventually win that division. So I got the Colts winning it this year. I think it's, you know, pretty agreed upon that, that the Colts are going to win the AFC South this year, but I don't know. Some people still believe in Tennessee. So it's pretty ironic because AJ Brown as a rookie established himself in the league. Like that's people were calling him the best rookie wide receiver. I mean, I, it was all up in the air with Terry him because DK was okay. kind of down. Like it was DK. All four had like good rookie years. So to say that Traylon Burks can't do it, it's like that's why I'm saying well, I have faith. And I just don't think he will. Right. I have I have more faith in Tree Gardas and Traylon Burks, and I obviously have way more faith in Ryan Tannehill than pretty much everybody. I feel like the whole world is against him at this point, and I'm I'm always that guy that's just sticking my head out for those guys, and I'm gonna continue to do the same. But yeah, I do I have faith in the Colts. I've always had faith in the Colts, mainly because of Frank Reich. Frank Reich is one of my favorite coaches in this league. And uh, you're giving Frank Reich, Matty Ice, a proven winner who is a, you know, a, 
a quarterback that just hasn't had much to work with in the last four years. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, I only I, I think he's only going to build on what he's done already in this league. I think the offensive line is only going to get better. Uh, the Colts defense is still really good. I think Kenny Moore is, again, one of their young pieces who's going to build on his Pro Bowl season last year. So I'm all, I'm all on board with the Colts winning this division, but I'm not going to sleep on Tennessee with Ryan Tannehill. I still think they get a winning season out of him. I think, again, I know we talked about Ryan Tannehill in, uh, in a couple episodes prior, but this is a dude that came into his Tennessee resume for a three-year span is one of the best in the entire league. So, like, what? Fourth highest passer rating of all time, AFC championship appearance, three straight winning season, three playoff berths, um, and he's seven and two without Derrick Henry. So this whole notion that he gets carried by him, that really we should be talking about Derrick Henry in the playoffs because in both their playoff losses, he's I think like sixty yards and like under four yards a carry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, if anything, there's been no shade thrown at him for that. And I think he's the best running back in football, but come on. I mean, you got to you gotta at least look at these things. I think there's so many things in the NFL that just get overlooked. And in that Dak Prescott argument we had, just an example, there's so many things, even with Dak, that get overlooked. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing with you. I think the Colts take this division. Uh, I, I just can't see the Titans ruling it for, what, a fourth straight year? Yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, as much as it would be cool, you know, the Ryan Tannehill fan in me, and I think Mike Vrabel is a hell of a coach, but – I think it's time for Frank Reich to finally take this division. I don't think he's done it since he's been uh, in Indy. So, nope. Yeah, he both times he's made the playoffs, he's been a wild card team. So, yeah. mm-hmm. let's see them do it. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Uh, leave it in the comments. Actually, I, I'm interested because we did have that Dak Prescott, and I know some Cowboys fans are going to see this and think, "Oh my God, this guy's such a Dak hater." But no, I'm not. I'm just a realist. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, let us know in the comments below. But uh, other than that, this has been uh, the Cold Heart Truth NFL podcast. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.